Well, of course, uh, the story of human rights does not begin with the adoption on 26th of June 1945 of the United Nations Charter. Um, the story of human rights uh, um, really began with the Enlightenment period and, and those of you who are familiar with the, the history of the French Revolution in 1789 or indeed with the, uh, the history of the um, uh, independence of the United States of America um, declared in, in 1776, uh, the adoption of the federal constitution in, in 1787 and the Bill of Rights appended to the federal constitution in, in 1791, um, you will know that, of course, human rights were very much at the center of these um, revolutionary processes. Um, indeed, in the 19th century, many liberal constitutions adopted uh, uh, during that period, particularly the, the years 1830, uh, 1848 on the European continent, were referring very explicitly to, to human rights and included human rights within these constitutions. Um, but human rights entered in international law in 1945, really. And um, this may be explained uh, if, we, if we look back at the, at the history of the Second World War. Um, this is a, a, a picture showing the US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt together with the UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill meeting on the HMS Prince of Wales in August 1941 when they adopted uh, a well-known document called the Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter described essentially the, the eight key principles on which uh, they believed uh, the, the new world order that would result from the Second World War um, should be established. Amongst these key principles, they mentioned the self-determination of peoples and they mentioned um, uh, that all men in all lands may uh, uh, live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. So this idea that um, human rights should be at the core of the reconstruction uh, following the Second World War was already present in 1941. And the uh, Atlantic Charter adopted by Roosevelt and Churchill was then um, approved by the Allies in the, the well-known um, United Nations Declaration of the 1st of January 1942. So it is probably unsurprising that uh, when the delegates uh, uh, met in San Francisco to prepare the United Nations Organization's Charter, they um, had a concern for human rights that was very explicit. Um, in fact, the purposes of the United Nations uh, listed in Article 1 of the Charter um, include the promotion and encouragement of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. And um, in the course of these discussions um, uh, preparing the UN Charter, uh, there were many references to human rights as part of what international economic and social cooperation should achieve. Um, look at Article 55 of the UN Charter. It mentions amongst the tasks of the United Nations, the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without discrimination, uh, without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. And Article 56 of the Charter says that all members of the United Nations pledge to take joint and separate action in cooperation with the organization for the achievement of these purposes, amongst which uh, human rights. In other terms, the UN Charter itself imposes on the members to work towards the fulfillment of human rights. Um, what is, of course, uh, perhaps strange is that the UN Charter does not define itself what human rights are, does not provide any catalogue of human rights. Now, in the course of the discussions having led to the establishment of the UN Charter, um, some such proposals were made to include a catalogue of human rights in the Charter itself. And particularly, I should mention the, uh, the work in this regard of the representative of Panama to the conference, Ricardo Alfaro. Ricardo Alfaro had been the president of Panama in 1930-1932. He later um, uh, was a judge at the um, International Court of Justice. And at the San Francisco conference, he put forward a proposal 
inspired by work he had done with the American Law Institute um, that had adopted in 1944 a statement on essential human rights. Um, and the proposal was to include in the UN Charter a list of human rights and fundamental freedoms um, that the UN should uh, seek to promote and, and ensure respect for. Um, that proposal was, was ultimately not um, successful, in part because the delegates felt that it was uh, going to be too much of a diversion and, and perhaps uh, too divisive an enterprise, and they wanted to, to finalize the work on the UN Charter um, sooner rather than later. So uh, what was decided is that uh, the definition of human rights would be the first task of the UN once the Charter would enter into force. And indeed, um, the um, Charter establishes, amongst uh, other organs of the UN, uh, an Economic and Social Council that was um, um, established inter alia to make recommendations for the purposes of promoting respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, and to prepare draft conventions that the General Assembly of the UN would then have to approve. Um, and the Economic and Social Council, the ECOSOC, was to work inter alia by establishing thematic commissions, working groups, if you wish, of diplomats, working on different um, thematic issues, including which um, uh, human rights were explicitly mentioned in Article 68 of the UN Charter. Um, there is a specific reference to the establishment of a commission um, for the promotion of human rights. And so, when the UN Charter was adopted and entered into force, um, uh, very swiftly, the Economic and Social Council, the ECOSOC, worked towards uh, implementing this um, Article 68 of the Charter, and it established a commission on the status of women in, in June 1946, uh, a body where um, uh, recommendations were prepared on the improvement of the situation of women. It is in the Commission on the States of Women that the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women would be adopted in, in 1979. Um, but most important, um, uh, the Economic and Social Council established the Commission on Human Rights. And that was for 60 years until its replacement by the Human Rights Council, that was the body within the UN where human rights matters were discussed. The Commission on Human Rights was um, a body of um, governmental delegates, high-level diplomats, um, initially a relatively small number, 18 uh, states were represented at the beginning in the Human Rights Commission, but later, um, when the UN expanded its membership, particularly after the uh, the decolonization period of the 1950s and 1960s, um, the membership of the um, Commission expanded um, and it had 53 members when it was uh, holding its final session in, um, in 2006. Um, now, um, the Commission on Human Rights um, was the body where um, human rights were to be, to be discussed, to delib deliberated, and um, um, the, the system was that the Commission on Human Rights was to adopt certain texts, uh, certain recommendations that would then be, be passed on to the ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, and then would be approved um, by the General Assembly and, and opened um, uh, as regards treaties to ratification by the states. Um, but the, the Commission on Human Rights had a very key role to fulfill. It was supported in this regard by a body of independent experts um, appointed, appointed in their personal capacity um, and uh, called the Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, although it was called until 1999 uh, the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and the Protection of Minorities. Um, now, it is within the Human Rights Commission that the most important instrument um, that was really the the, the, the leading um, document beginning the great adventure of the United Nations in the area of human rights, as it has been called, was adopted. And that document was, of course, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted just before midnight on the 10th of December 
1948 by the General Assembly, adopted by, by 48 uh, votes in favor. Eight states um, abstained. Um, the United Nations at the time was composed of, uh, were composed of 56 um, member states. And the abstaining states were South Africa, um, uh, that had just recently inaugurated its, its um, apartheid policy and therefore was opposed to a declaration that would um, state uh, uh, that uh, racial discrimination should be prohibited. Um, another country that abstained was Saudi Arabia, opposed to the uh, right to choose and change one's religion, um, and the USSR and its satellite states, uh, who feared that human rights would be, would be a pretext to interfere with their domestic affairs. But apart from these eight abstentions, there was no vote against the declaration, and we may say, therefore, that the declaration was adopted uh, pretty much by, by consensus um, in, in Paris in, in 1948. Now, the declaration is, is, a, is a hugely important um, um, instrument adopted by the by the Commission on Human Rights, um, it was really um, the, 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 in, in 30 articles a summary of what international human rights uh, would would be in the next uh, in the next years. And um, although later many treaties were adopted uh, uh, at UN level um, in the area of human rights, um, all human rights uh, in many ways are summarized in those 30 articles. Now. Um, the declaration was prepared uh, within the Commission on Human Rights by a working group established to that effect. Um, there was another working group working on monitoring mechanisms and there was yet another working on um, a new uh, treaty, uh, a convention uh, protecting human rights um, in the form of a legally binding instrument. But this working group of the Human Rights Commission, headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who was the widow of late uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had um, uh, died early in, in 1945, um, uh, that group um, um, managed to, to achieve a consensus across its members um, swiftly enough for the declaration to be presented to the General Assembly after just a couple of years of, wor of, wor of work. Um, the group was also um, uh, including René Cassin, René Cassin representing the French um, government. Uh, uh, he was a minister of President Charles de Gaulle at the time. And to a large extent, Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin were the leading figures within this group that drafted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, the document that was adopted on 10th of December 1948 had been prepared um, on the basis of a draft that was um, proposed to the working group by this um, Canadian um, Director of Human Rights within the United Nations, um, head of the Directorate of Human Rights uh, at the time, a young Canadian international law professor called John Peters Humphrey. And John Humphrey um, basically prepared the work of the Commission by comparing how human rights were protected under domestic constitutions across the world. He included the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights appended to the US federal constitution, uh, the Déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen uh, adopted in, 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 um, in France on, on um, 14th of August uh, 1789. And um, he um, compared all these documents trying to identify the common denominator across them that would be um, acceptable for states um, um, to, to adopt as part of a, of a universal declaration um, of human rights. Um, and it's interesting to note this because it, it provides um, already an indication of the specific nature of human rights that are neither pure international law nor uh, just reducible to um, one part of domestic constitutional law. They are really a hybrid between the two. They are not um, um, classic international law, but they, of course, do not belong just to constitutional law anymore. And um, this hybrid nature of human rights is part of what um, explains how they have been developed in 
uh, recent years. And we'll return to this point, of course, in the, in the remainder of this course. Now, um, it's important to note that the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was um, also important because it listed in its 30 articles both civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. Um, and the idea of interdependence and indivisibility and equal importance of all human rights, whether civil and political or whether economic, social and cultural, was very much uh, present in the discussions that led to the adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And indeed, this was faithful to the, to the view or to, to the vision of um, the late US President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, although elected originally in, in 1932 on a relatively conservative, um, fiscally conservative platform, um, became a promoter of economic and social rights um, um, as a means to address the economic crisis that the US were, were facing um, in the 1930s. And um, he um, led the effort of the US to strengthen the welfare state at uh, federal level. Um, this picture here shows him signing uh, the Social Security Act on 14th of August 1935. And this is just one of the um, uh, very important pieces of legislation that um, Roosevelt um, um, adopted uh, for the United States um, as part of this um, welfare state being established um, in the US. And so this philosophy that um, human rights required not only that people be free from fear, but also that they be, that they be free from want, um, was an idea that was very central to the Universal Declaration um, of Human Rights. Um, in fact, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, presented um, his State of the Union address to the US Congress in, in 1944, he made a reference to what he called the Second Bill of Rights, which was a metaphor to say that um, the rights of the Bill of Rights appended to the federal constitution adopted in the US were incomplete and that there was a need to adopt legislation uh, to protect um, the right to food, uh, the right to housing, the right to social security, for example, for people to be protected from um, economic um, uh, disempowerment. Um, um, and uh, the argument of Roosevelt was essentially that um, 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 economic and social security were key to avoid uh, people being tempted uh, by political extremism. Um, uh, people who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of, are the stuff of which dictatorships are made um, is uh, one famous sentence that um, uh, President Roosevelt uses in the State of the Union address. So, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was really um, 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 very much um, um, in the continuity of this idea of interdependence and indivisibility. However, it's important to note that already in 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, there was a, an understanding that economic and social rights were of a different nature than civil and political rights. Of course, they were equally important. Of course, the two sets of rights were considered to be indivisible and interdependent. But nevertheless, um, economic and social rights were distinct and may call for a different type of um, a supervision mechanism. Look at Article 20 t 22 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is the first provision of the Declaration that refers to economic and social rights. This uh, Article 22 is on the right to social security, but it has actually a general um, reference to economic and social rights, and it says the following. It says, everyone as a member of society has a right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation and in accordance with the organization and resources of each state of the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. Um, that reference to the right to social security as requiring international cooperation, as uh, requiring a progressive realization 
um, in accordance with the organization and resources of each state is in fact a statement that economic and social rights are of a different kind, are of a different nature, require time to be implemented, require budgetary commitments, um, and require international cooperation for them to be um, effectively realized. Um, and the reference to the resources of each state, in particular, um, uh, was an allusion to the fact that developing countries could not be expected to protect the right to food, the right to housing, the right to education, um, uh, the right to health, um, uh, like um, uh, rich countries uh, could be uh, expected to, um, to do. Um, so the, the, the level of development or the degree of development of each state was a relevant factor to be taken into account um, in um, assessing whether states are doing enough to implement economic and social rights. Um, and this idea is an idea that will uh, remain, that would remain in international human rights uh, really for the next uh, uh, 60 years. Um, it is uh, only in 2008 that um, one might say the bridge was, was completely um, um, uh, built between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic um, and social rights on the, on the other hand. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, led to a number of developments at um, uh, UN level. Um, and in fact, over the years, the declaration was implemented through a range of instruments um, that protect human rights under uh, the chapeau of the United Nations. Um, nine core human rights treaties were adopted um, over the years, beginning with the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, adopted on the 21st of December 1965. Um, it is a bit paradoxical that this international convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination was the first treaty to be adopted um, and it was adopted very swiftly because the newly decolonized countries um, who had recently gained independence in the 1960s, um, particularly in, in Africa, um, very much insisted on racial discrimination the elimination of racial discrimination being at the top of the UN agenda. And so they, they pushed for this convention to be adopted um, very, very quickly. Um, and they had, um, at the time, acquired um, a sufficient importance in UN membership to push for this instrument to be adopted. But, but the, the instruments that were really the immediate continuation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were two covenants adopted finally on the 16th of December 1968, 1966. Um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, let us go through some of these instruments uh, very briefly um, to understand the importance that they've acquired in recent years. Um, firstly, the first UN Human Rights Treaty to be adopted, and that was um, um, uh, really the model for all the other UN human rights treaties was the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It has today 176 states parties. It's a relatively widely ratified uh, instrument and you see in this map um, the states parties to the convention, um, the um, states that are in dark blue on this map um, are the states that have accepted the right to individual communications being filed with the uh, body of independent experts in charge of supervising compliance with this convention. This is the third committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, and a significant number of countries have accepted this right of individual victims of racial discrimination to file communications with um, the third committee. Um, but other states have ratified this convention, are bound by this convention, without having accepted this right to individual communication. And um, you see this map that um, 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 identifies these states in a slightly lighter blue um, here um, on, this, on this map. Um, 
as I said, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 um, was initially a political declaration, um, meant to have primarily a symbolic value, um, but immediately work began on implementing the declaration in the form of binding treaties. And the two treaties that were the immediate follow-up to the declaration were two covenants adopted in 1966. Symbolically, it's important that these covenants were adopted on the same day, on the 16th of December 1966. Um, although in 1951 it had been decided that two separate instruments should be adopted, one for economic, social and cultural rights, the other for civil and political rights, not because some rights were more important than the others, not because states were challenging the idea that all rights were equally important and were interdependent and indivisible. Rather, the idea was economic, social and cultural rights were rights of a different nature, calling for a different type of procedure, a different supervisory mechanism, um, and therefore should be dealt with in a separate instrument, um, resulting in the UN General Assembly at the request um, of the um, um, Commission on Human Rights, really, and, and, and um, the Economic and Social Council, um, to adopt a resolution asking for two separate instruments um, to, be, to be prepared um, that finally, after some, uh, um, some 18 years um, of, of discussions, being adopted in 1966. Now, um, the two covenants, um, the um, Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, uh, the ICESCR, and the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, were um, mostly adopted simultaneously by states, um, ratified by states uh, together. There were some exceptions to this, but that explains why though the two covenants entered into force roughly at the same time. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights entered into force in January 1976. Today it has 161 states parties, which is a very significant membership, um, um, although it is not uh, quite universal yet. Um, and you see on this map, in dark blue, the states that have ratified the covenant, in light blue, the states that have only signed the covenant but have not ratified it, um, and um, in blank, um, states that have taken no action whatsoever uh, to move towards ratification of the, of the covenant. Now, the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights only recently has been complemented by an optional protocol um, that shall give um, to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights the new task, the new competence to receive individual communications um, by which individual victims of violations of economic, social and cultural rights can complain that they have been um, victims of such violations, allowing the committee to adopt um, uh, decisions to, to express views as to whether or not there has been a violation of their, of their rights. Um, of course, this is a very recent instrument. It was only adopted on 10th of December 2008, symbolically, um, interestingly, exactly 60 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was, was adopted. Um, and because it's a still recent instrument, it has only been ratified by a relatively small number of states. Um, 11 states uh, have ratified this instrument on 1st of November 2013, but gradually uh, this um, uh, optional protocol certainly shall attract a larger membership and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights shall be uh, in a position to develop a, a, a case law uh, based on these communications um, that it shall receive. Um, now, the other covenant adopted at the same time as the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was a covenant on civil and political rights. Um, the ICCPR that entered into force just a few months after the um, uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The ICCPR entered into force on 23rd of March 1976 and it has 167 states parties, slightly more 
then the um, ICESCR um, in November 2013. Um, China, for example, has ratified the um, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but not the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the situation is the exact opposite for the United States that has ratified the ICCPR but has not ratified the um, ICESCR on um, economic and social rights. Um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, also has an, an optional protocol allowing the Human Rights Committee. The Human Rights Committee is the body of independent experts trusted with supervising compliance with the ICCPR under the, um, the Covenant um, on Civil and Political Rights. Um, and the optional protocol allows the Human Rights Committee to receive individual communications emanating from victims of violations of the civil and political rights recognized under the ICCPR. Now, that optional protocol was adopted in, in 1966, at the very same time that the, um, that the International Covenant um, on Civil and Political Rights itself was, was adopted. And so, unsurprisingly, it has been ratified much more widely than the optional protocol to the ICESCR. 115 states parties um, 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 have accepted this optional protocol uh, to the ICCPR. Um, other conventions may be mentioned, although I will not go through the full list of them. This would be uh, uh, perhaps too long to, to do, but uh, to give you some examples. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was adopted in, in 1979, entered into force uh, quite rapidly after this in 1981, and it has today 187 states parties. It's a very widely ratified convention, although um, the most ratified of these is the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I'll mention in, um, in a minute. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, usually referred to by its acronym the CEDAW Convention, um, is a convention that also has been um, complemented more recently um, in 1999 by an optional protocol providing the CEDAW committee, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, to receive individual communications uh, denouncing um, violations of the, of the convention. Um, this um, optional protocol, in force since 2000, has today 104 states parties, um, and you have here the map describing um, the states that have accepted this competence of the CEDAW committee. I mentioned already the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most widely um, human rights instrument, uh, the most widely ratified human rights instrument. It has 193 states parties um, today. The only states that have not um, ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child are the United States of America and Somalia. Somalia that is without um, a real government um, since 1991. Um, but apart from these uh, two states, all the other states, um, all the other members of the UN have ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which um, um, uh, therefore has a quasi-universal uh, acceptance across, across states. Now, of course, these core UN human rights treaties, um, uh, nine in number, um, are important. They have some common characteristics uh, that explains why they are usually discussed together and dealt with together. All these human rights treaties that I've mentioned, uh, the CRC, the Rights on the, on the Rights of the Child, the um, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, the, um, um, the two covenants uh, on civil and political rights uh, and on economic, social and cultural rights, um, uh, and of course the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, all these core UN human rights treaties establish um, expert bodies, um, human rights treaty bodies, as they are called, composed of independent experts that monitor compliance. And they do so by receiving reports from states uh, on which they adopt uh, 
some um, concluding uh, observations or comments. Um, they also adopt uh, general comments or general recommendations. They adopt, in some cases, when they have a competence to do so, they adopt um, decisions or views on the individual communications that they receive uh, when victims of violations denounce the violations that they have been um, um, inflicted. Um, um, and um, these core UN human rights treaties therefore follow a common structure. But of course, within the UN, there are other instruments that are relevant um, to human rights. For example, in 1948, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was adopted, a very in important instrument um, that led to a very interesting advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the 28th of May 1951. We will discuss this in the context of reservations. Um, we have a convention on the non-applicability of statutory limitations to war crimes and crimes against humanity. We have an international convention on the suppression and punishment of the crime of apartheid adopted in 1973. Um, so the UN um, human rights treaties stricto sensu, the nine core UN human rights treaties are not the only instruments that are relevant to human rights, but they are the most important and these are the instruments on which this course shall mostly uh, uh, be focused on. Um, let me close by emphasizing the distinctions between um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the two uh, covenants that implemented in treaty form the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. It's important to note that um, these two treaties um, are different because of the um, mechanisms uh, for their supervision that were established um, under respectively the ICESCR and the ICCPR based on the view of states that um, civil and political rights could be immediately enforced by courts and by independent experts. Uh, these were rights considered to be justiciable, if you wish, when economic and social rights were considered not to present these characteristics. Um, economic and social rights were considered to be um, subject only to progressive realization. Um, um, they required time to be implemented. They required budgets to be invested. They uh, could only be implemented thanks to international assistance and cooperation. And for this reason, the ICCPR established a, a human rights committee, a body of independent experts to monitor compliance. And there was no such body of independent experts initially um, um, monitoring compliance with the um, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In fact, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was only established almost 10 years after the um, um, ICESCR entered into force in 1985 because the Economic and Social Council realized that it was unable to really um, process adequately the reports submitted by, by states um, um, describing how they were implementing the ICESCR. And so the, the ECOSOC established the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights by Resolution 17, 1985, um, modeled on the model of the Human Rights Committee, um, um, establishing these, um, this new body um, um, to, to supervise compliance with the um, ICESCR. Um, uh, this also explains why in the ICCPR there is a reference in Article 2, Paragraph 3, to the duty of states to provide effective remedies to individuals whose civil and political rights would be violated. When this provision is not found in the ICESCR, although the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has since adopted various general comments emphasizing the, new, the need to establish effective remedies for individuals, victims of violations of their economic and social rights, that is not something that was uh, stated as such in the ICESCR. Um, I already mentioned that the ICCPR was complemented already in 1966 with an optional protocol providing for the possibility of individual communications being filed 
with the Human Rights Committee. A contrario, we had to wait until the 10th of December 2008 for the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to receive the same competence um, under the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, under the newly adopted optional protocol to that covenant um, um, uh, adopted again in 2008. Um, the rights under the ICCPR are considered to be immediate. The rights under the ICESCR are considered to be subject to progressive realization. And we will discuss in great detail Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the ICESCR that defines what progressive realization means and um, uh, under which conditions the resources available to each state um, should be taken into account in assessing whether the state is moving swiftly enough towards the realization of economic and social rights. Um, economic and social rights are subject to uh, the availability of resources under the ICESCR, and they depend for their realization on international assistance and cooperation. And in these two uh, dimensions, in these two respects, they are different from civil and political rights. Uh, to a large extent, we may say that uh, over the past um, 65 years, since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, the history of international human rights was one um, that aimed to, to bridge the gap between these two sets of rights. And to a large extent, that is uh, the, the most important development we have witnessed over the past um, 65 years, and it is um, uh, in part um, uh, what we will uh, describe in this course um, on international human rights.